Host, uh, I don't know what happened to my intro. I hope I'm not walking over KGRA Radio's intro. Um, I tested it before the show. Everything was fine. Uh, my intro did not work for some reason. But anyway, um, this is going to be a fun show tonight. And welcome to it. This is uh, Martin Willis. And uh, we have two guests coming up tonight. First of all, we have Lee Spiegel. He's going to be talking about a show that's upcoming soon, um, within a few weeks, we hope. And uh, and then after that, I have Rich Hoffman. Um, he is uh, he was back on three years ago. A lot has happened since he was on, um, and he has a great background. Started when he was extremely young, thirteen years old, uh, checking out UFOs, and uh, was actually on the Phil Donahue at age fifteen, talking UFOs. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, so uh, that's our guest. We have Alejandro Rojas coming up in just a minute with UFO, UFO updates. And uh, the blog we have this week from Charles Lear is, trust me, this is science. It's basically about um, if you're looking into the UFO topic, you know, more or less beware um, and look out for pseudoscience and try to figure out which is pseudoscience and which is real science, if you can find any real science when it comes to UFOs. So uh, check that blog out. It's on podcastufo.com. Um, we also have a Facebook page, uh, Podcast UFO, um, and um, and live shows. I think that's how it's titled. And so check that out. There's 22,000 or so people over there and a lot of activity, uh, UFO updates every day. And speaking of updates... We have Alejandro Rojas for UFO updates. Welcome, friend. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Jeez, that was weird. No intro. I don't know what happened. Strange. Yeah. Well, you're supposed to pretend like that's the way it's supposed to be on the radio. That's the thing is you pretend oh, like right. like nothing went wrong. Yeah. And you just move on. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So. so oh, that was a great. I really liked how you tried this kind of no intro thing, uh, so we could get right into it. That's right. Yeah. It was a nice. Uh, Nice little silence. Dead air is wonderful. Yes. Yeah, a little bit of peace and quiet so we can reflect on on yeah. what we're doing and, and gather our thoughts before That's right. we get into this heavy topic. Next week, I'll make sure I have crickets going at the time. <laughs> but anyway, so how's everything going? Good. So a lot's gone on. Uh, of course, uh, right, because I wasn't on the show last week. We keep talking about some of these stories that came out in the last week. It feels like we've talked about, but there's no way because we haven't talked in the last week. But uh, it's been an exciting week, of course. All of the stories are mostly around uh, the the uh, program, unidentified, you know, America's UFO investigation. So on the History Channel, that first episode finally came out. You and I, of course, have talked about it uh, since we got an early preview because we're special. Um, <laughs> we were in special class when we were younger. Yeah, and. Sure. Uh, and we, of course, both like the show, but there's a lot of information. Now, the first episode uh, is mostly information, especially our listeners will be familiar with, because it included the Nimitz case, uh, some of what was in there, which I think some of our people might not have known about, uh, was, you know, this was the first time we had heard from the uh, female pilot, and right. she still mm -hmm. remained anonymous in this. She was blacked out. Uh, so that was really interesting to have her go through Nimitz. And also, even though, you know, both of you and I have had people on to talk about this and I've written a lot about it, there's so many working parts in the background. It's really confusing. And so I thought they did a really great job of going over Steve Justice's background, Tom DeLong's, Lou Elizondo's, um, Chris Mellon, all the major players. I think they did. They all have such incredible histories. And uh, credibility that substantiates, you know, what they're talking about. And uh, I thought they did a really good job tackling all of their backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, I'm sure as um, myself, you probably heard from a lot of people that watched it and, you know, got all kinds of feedback. Um, someone said there were too many commercials, you know, that you and I were <laughs> lucky enough not to be able to watch it without commercials. So I hate uh, commercials, too, yeah. so I get that one. Um, and then, you know, people are talking, oh, it's just the same stuff rehashed. But I think, you know, like you mentioned, the female pilot, that was really great. Um, and I, you know, there's a lot to that story. And, you know, it's, it was, I believe it was a, a really good one to start off with myself I in agree. particular. Yeah, it was, it, they had to, you know, it's the one that was out there 
And they did offer something new. They did offer the perspective uh, of this, uh, you know, other pilot that we haven't heard from. Uh, they also had a couple people come in and analyze the video. And I thought that was really interesting. And you and I both spoke with the producer, Anthony Lap Lape, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, he's great. He, uh, you can tell he, and he was right, you know, what he told us in our interviews came out to be true in the show, that they were really just letting things flow. Like he said, he didn't want anybody to do a double take. Like if they screwed up, he was like, no, that's done. You know, we're just recording what happens as it happens. We're not, we don't want to seem scripted or, or script anything at all. And that came across in the show, but it came across very credible. Of course, I feel, you know, we've heard from Lou and, and Lou's uh, very good at articulating, um, you know, what he feels or what he's trying to do. Chris Mellon, of course, has been incredible. And that's where the news comes in, getting into the, the news, is that we've got a lot of these people on television. So we've got Chris Mellon on Fox News, CNN, Good Morning America. Uh, we've got all of these these people, essentially the main players. Well, Lou... Um, on all of those, Tom DeLong on a couple things. Uh, Tom DeLong did a Newsweek opinion piece that was really good, uh, actually. And, and I say actually because, of course, we all know Tom could get kind of um, off into some more odd topics, more speculative topics than the rest of the group. But he really stuck to uh, the topics at hand. Uh, that was really good. And then the big news from the week was this New York Times article which introduced some new pilots that we're going to hear from in future episodes of Unidentified. And these are pilots who were with the Roosevelt, who uh, were involved with UFO incidents that happened in 2014 and 2015. And shockingly, you know, these guys said that uh, they were having these experiences or at least catching these things on radar for uh, almost daily, um, that they didn't know what they were, uh, they assumed that perhaps somebody was testing some sort of new drone, uh, you know, kind of a black project type of thing, until they had their own encounter when two of the jets had one of these things. Um, well, in the story, they make it sound like it would, they almost had a near miss. One of these things yeah. was in between them that was cube shaped with kind of an orb around it. And that's when they really caught their attention there like wow this is dangerous this is not good uh if this is you know obviously it's something physical this could really put our lives in danger at this point so that's when they started taking it very seriously uh what's really exciting and uh, of course i'll plug it on my blog but a lot of people have posted this now is the history also released to some of us some clips you probably saw these some yes. clips from those navy pilots and those were really cool so I've got those posted at AlejandroTRojas.com where you could see them. Three separate clips, about a minute or so each, where it's the pilots talking about this incident. But what was revealed in these clips is that these incidents are also the origins of the other two F-18 FLIR videos that we've been question questioning since the beginning. The one called Go Fast and the one called Gimbal. We haven't known, you know, where did these things come from? And now we know. Uh, we, of course, we have limited information thus far, except to know that, you know, these pilots are aware of it, have seen the video, do believe that it's something unusual. Um, so that's really exciting that we're going to hear more from this. Uh, you know, the other thing that we did get a little bit of information of, and we're getting more, is, of course, this Oregon event I did talk about on the last show with you. Uh, the McMinnville event where David Fravor, yeah. one of the other pilots, the, the wing commander who was on the Nimitz. And he talked about the gimbal video in particular because he was uh, saying, you know, somebody had asked. Well, actually, this was my question. Um, I had asked about, you know, was this a missile or an aircraft? Because there's a lot of the skeptics and debunkers out there who have said that uh, all this was was, you know, a rotation. Even our good buddy Mark D'Antonio, I believe, believes this. But Fravor talked about how he feels that's absolutely, there's no way. And he talks about the characteristics of an aircraft. An aircraft, and he makes a great point that you can't, an aircraft can't fly like this. Yeah. It looks like they are sometimes, but in order to create lift on the wings, they have to be creating, you know, a friction. They've got to bank left or right if they're going to go sideways like this. Yeah. He said sometimes the Blue Angels can kind of do these maneuvers for a little while with, they do these tricks, but... Otherwise, it's going to fall out of the sky. Right. So this was not an aircraft that went like this. And what we're, the effects we're seeing are not uh, 
uh, you know, effect from the actual lens of the um, of the FLIR camera. So, you know, we now at least we're getting and I, you know, many of us assume this was the case that these guys aren't going to come out and say that these videos are unusual for no reason. I mean, they're credentials and there are, are on the line their credibility is on the line as well so when these pilots are coming out and saying no you know this is not something conventional and so, something i've dealt with before and is demonstrating some um advanced technology there's no doubt that they've put a lot of thought towards it to make those determinations and come out and say those things that's right hey <coughs> pardon me we are um out of time because i only have i'm only gonna have leon for about 10 minutes or so until our okay. break. So anyway, thanks so much, Alejandro, and uh, we'll be talking to you next week. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Talk to you then. All right. So our next guest needs no introduction. That means I'm not <laughs> going to introduce him except for say, hello, Lee. Welcome to the show. Hello, Martin. Thanks for that <laughs> glorious introduction. <laughs> <laughs> that was your uh, whole background you. to everything. Yeah. That, well, I, I, that's, that's called a mini bio. No, I, yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> no, you've been on so many times. On the there, you've been on so many times. Um, but I, I guess it would be just a, uh, we're just so short on time because um, we only have 10 minutes until we go into break. But uh, so Lee's been in the, well, you say it in a quick nutshell, uh, your background for the new listeners, if you would. Well, I've been investigating, researching this crazy phenomenon called UFOs. For 46 years now, makes me an old timer in the the whole series. Um, I've uh, among the things that I've uh, helped to do to forward people's information about this was uh, 1975. I produced uh, for CBS a vinyl documentary record album called UFOs: The Credibility Factor, in which it was the first time that I the voices. Of, of people who have had encounters or had strong opinions about UFOs. And these are, uh, these are people in science, in the military, in politics, and, and had them come together in one voice to basically ask the government, please come clean about UFO information. And from there, I kind of leapfrogged a couple of years later into bringing UFOs to the United Nations in 1978. And, and then kind of from there, kept moving forward in this, I guess, mission of mine. I spent eight years on NBC radio, uh, just doing unexplained phenomena features, more than 1,500 programs about the topic. Wow. And, uh, and more recently, seven years I spent as the chief UFO writer at the Huffington Post. That's right. And, and as you and many of your listeners know now, I'm still involved with um, film producer James Fox, we're putting it together. Uh, we're, at, we're in the last throes of an upcoming documentary. And uh, for those who don't know the name of it yet, we started to spill the beans a little bit. Uh, this is going to be called The Phenomenon. Oh, you finally named it. This is uh, name, yeah. num name number three, isn't it? <laughs> but it's uh, going <laughs> to stick, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And, what, what, and one of the reasons why um, that we've actually chosen that that name has to go back to literally 1947, uh, a, a previously classified military document that's now commonly referred to as the Twining oh, yeah. Memo. Mm -hmm. uh, you, when flying saucer reports were flourishing in 47, Air Force Lieutenant General Nathan Twining, he was the commander of the Air Material Command, uh, he issued a very eye-opening but secret at the time memo to the Army Air Forces, and the subject line of it was the Air Material Command opinion concerning flying disks. And among the things that this very serious memo stated was, and this is a quote from it, quote, the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. fictitious. There are objects approximating the shape of a disk of such size as to appear to be as large as man-made aircraft, uh, unquote. So this, this memo went on to describe the incredible maneuverability demonstrated, demonstrated by these objects 72 years ago. And these things are still outmaneuvering current global aircraft technology. And so that, that twining memo eventually brought about uh, a multi 
military investigation known as Project Blue Book. But it was the beginning of, of the quote where he referred to it as the phenomenon. Both mm-hmm. uh, James Fox, I credit James with saying, let's call it the phenomenon, the, the documentary, because in so many places historically in documents, uh, it's always referred to as the phenomenon. And that just kind of stuck with us. We went, yes, there's our title. Uh, wow. Simple and good. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah, that's great. Um, it started out for the listener that, because um, I still get email, I think I got one two weeks ago, someone saying, when is 701 coming out? <laughs> and that was uh, <laughs> yeah. that was the first working title. So this that's is right. what this is uh, morphed into at this time. And uh, it's going to be a smash when it actually comes out. I know it is um, with the work that you've described to me and the budget and everything. It's going to be a major movie, and I can't wait for it. And so, well, we're looking, you know, we're looking forward to, to, to doing it and to talking about it. I'm looking forward more to talking about it on your show. And I'm also happy that you and I will soon be co-radio colleagues on That's KGRA right. Digital Broadcasting when I begin my own program called Edge of Reality Radio. And that's coming up pretty soon. I would think within yes. a few, two to three weeks or something like that. And you're filling well, we're, we're, in uh, yes. Linda Moulton House time slot on Thursday, which is, is that 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? Eastern Time? That's what, I'm, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. All that we're really left to do now is figuring out the technical logistics uh, of my broadcasting the show uh, from New York. Uh, you know, back to the KGRA main broadcast studio in uh, in Utah, so that it can have a real nice clean signal all across America, and then later across across all international borders. So I'm looking forward to this, and I want to get this thing rolling as soon as possible. In fact, I've already outlined the guest list for approximately the first five months of my show. I can't believe that you told me that the other day. <laughs> Five months and uh, well, I, well, I'm serious about doing this. I guess you, know? you are. I, you know, I'm I'm lucky if I have a month ahead. It's uh, it's not always that e- an easy thing to do, um, especially if someone changes at the last minute and you can't get a fill in. And um, and thank you. Last week I announced I didn't have any guests, and you know you were gracious enough to come on. Um, and uh, mm, sure. al- also, um, let's talk about. I can't believe who your first guest is. Let's talk about a couple of that that, and a few other <laughs> guests you have coming up. Well, my first guest, hopefully, if, uh, if he still wants to do it and in the mood, <laughs> yeah. because it's been a while since <clears throat> since I asked him, is uh, uh, a man named Jacques Ballet. Perhaps you and some of your audience, mm-hmm. or all of your audience, have heard of Jacques. Never heard of him, no. Uh, <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> No. Jacques is 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 not 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 just simply a scientist and astronomer astrophysicist. Uh, he he is like a, a legend, and, and not just in, in UFOs, but but in many areas of science. He's done so many things. He was the first scientist decades ago who who mapped did a computer mapping of the planet Mars for NASA. Hmm, Little I things didn't like know that, that that people don't know, know about. Wow. Yeah, he's a he's a multifaceted guy. Very interesting. And who who's some is. of your other uh, guests? I know you were going to have Stan Friedman until we lost him. He was uh, that, really that, looking forward that, to coming. That's right. Out. Yeah. Um, yeah, and 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 yes. So Stan, uh, very sadly, uh, will not be with us. He's he's with us, but he's still with us. Yeah. On so many areas and so many levels. Um, going to be talking with with as many people in. In the UFO field as I can, I'm looking for military folks. I'm going to be talking with pilots that haven't done a lot of radio interviews, uh, m- more politicians, uh, more international wow. uh, figures of people that we haven't heard from, and and also especially more scientists, because now we're at a point in time historically where scientists aren't just saying, oh, there's nothing to this, this whole thing. You know, UFOs are just strange lights or strange inverted weather patterns and things like that. No, it's gone beyond that now, mostly thanks to the New York Times in 2017 and all the stuff that came out with the Pentagon revelations of their top secret UFO studies. And, and now more recently, uh, the, the whole revelation that the, that the Navy is now creating 
new guidelines for their for their pilots and and Navy personnel who have had very close encounters. And, and this is not just something that, that's just recent. They are now admitting these things have been going on for a very long time. And I've been trying to stress that every time I do some kind of an interview is, is that this is not a new thing. It's not an American thing. It's an international phenomenon that we're dealing with. And part of me is kind of curious. I still wonder why the Pentagon or the Navy would suddenly come out and say, yeah, uh, our pilots or military forces have had strange encounters with strange things that we don't understand. Why would they suddenly say that now in history? I don't fully understand that. What, what purpose will that serve any of us to have this kind of information come out now, like on a more official level, which, which is what this is talking about. It, this is what it feels like. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, the, there's a definite, I think there's a definite feeling in the air. I that, do too. I'm, you know, yeah, like, who, yeah, yeah. Who, who, whoever's in charge of what the public has told about UFOs over many decades now, Martin, maybe they're loosening up a little, but for what reason, what, what purpose will it serve to admit to the citizens of our planet, that unexplained aircraft of unknown origin have been operating in our skies for a very long time. So on on the new edge of reality radio, I want to explore this a lot and see where it takes us. That is awesome. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm definitely going to be tuning in. Um, and and uh, so when that becomes available, I'll make an announcement on this show and make sure that everyone knows when to tune in. Oh, and, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I and I love what you're doing. I'm I'm glad that finally you and I are going to be able to do the same thing now together at the same place. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, com- competition, right? Isn't that what they call it? <laughs> no. No. I, <laughs> no. That, no. that that that's not yeah. really competition. This I know. Is, I know. Is, I'm just the, teasing. You know. But the people on KGRA, I don't think anybody is in comp- competition with each other. We just all no. kind of want to get this information out in the best possible, credible, efficient way. Yeah. And you um, you had 1,500 shows years ago and some amazing, yeah. amazing uh, people you spoke to back then. And I'm really, really, I'm truly looking forward to it. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about your show coming up. And so, Lee, oh, thank um, you, Martin. yeah, we're, we're going to head into break, and um, I'm going to be breaking on YouTube. Before I do, this is a special note to YouTube listeners. Um, I was hoping to make an announcement for this coming Friday uh, around noontime. Um, And I did not get the 100% confirmation email that I was waiting for. It's going to be a special show, a live stream. You're going to want to see it. So keep an eye on my channel if you're watching on YouTube. Um, Please uh, click subscribe and click the little bell next to the subscribe button. That way you'll get a notification of what I have coming up. But it's about 95% sure that I'm going to have a really, really good show coming up this Friday afternoon. I think it is 12, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. <clears throat> and um, also, if you want to get a notif- notification by email, just run over to podcastufo.com. On the sidebar, there is a little email um, notification thing you can fill out. Lee, thanks so much. And uh, Oh, my pleasure, Martin. Thank you. All right. Take care, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk uh, real soon. Looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Everyone hang in there. I'll be right back with Rich Hoffman. All right. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Sorry for the extended break. Uh, We had a little bit of technology issues, I would say. And speaking of that, our guest, Rich Hoffman, he's um, an information technology consultant and strategist. Um, He has been with a, a, well, he's been a defense contractor for over 20 years, primarily uh, for the Army Material Command HQ with a variety of other companies. He's got quite a background. He started when he was extremely young, was on the Phil Donahue show at only 15 years old. Uh, I think they called, uh, well, welcome to the show, uh, Rich. Good to have you back. Hey, it's good to be back with you, Martin. I, uh, I enjoy your show, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Good. Uh, when yeah. someone like you says that, I really, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, so I think... Didn't they call you a UFO expert? I always love that one, don't you? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I got it. Yeah, well, the funny thing about it was I, I used, uh, you know, I, I had a license plate, uh, and it was UFO XPRT, <laughs> and, and it and I and it, it it fit for the back end of my bumper in the car. And the funny part about it was, it you know, it caused a lot of conversations because I'd be at a gas station and somebody would see it and they'd say, "Oh, wow, are you? Uh, what is that?" Or then you get the people that say it's you Foxbert, and I'm going, "Well, okay, <laughs> now let me explain that one." But I, it, it just starts it, it as a conversation starter, so I just use that for my even for my email and stuff. I said, "The hell with it, I'll just use it." <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, good. yeah. It's funny. It's fun. Yeah, but you've been you have um, you have a, a great background, and you've taken the subject seriously as you've you know gone through time, and uh, so you've been. Yeah. You were actually had cases that you were researching at a very young age, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, so let me give you a little bit of an age. I guess sort of when I was 13 years old and, and uh, I was living in Dayton, Ohio. And so I would, it's right about that time that I found out that there was a project just up the street at, at Wright Patterson. And, you know, and so. Uh, my first book that I picked up was the Captain Edward Ruppelt talking about the the Project Blue Book, and I'm going like, man, this is just up the road for me. And uh, it, it, at that age, you know, it's quite a, it's a, quite an impression, uh, and it just propelled me big time into it. And I so I started doing a, you know, at that time I was doing a lot of like clippings and and uh, just getting every book that I could possibly get, every magazine that I could get was reading voraciously uh and uh, the next thing i know i was like somebody asked me up to give a presentation at some sort of an astronomy club uh in dayton and i went up there and, and did that and then somebody else heard that i did that and then the next thing i know i was like i was getting calls from like sir thomas clubs and optimist clubs and, and everything else want me to come and then next thing i know churches wanted me to come <laughs> wow. so and then and then Eventually, got word over to the Phil Donahue, and this is before he went up to Chicago and really became famous. So it was when he was just starting in, in Dayton, and uh, and uh, so I was like, I guess an early experiment. But <laughs> they had heard that I was going around talking all this stuff about UFOs, and so let's just do it. And then the next thing you know is that that propelled me even further as to. Now I'm starting to get phone calls from like people like left and right saying, "Hey, can you come and check this out?" And it's not like I was an investigator at that time, but uh, I eventually moved into like, uh, "Hey, I got to be able to do that." And, and then in 1965, there were a, a slurry of uh, activity, and I was going crazy trying to keep up with some of that work on cases, uh, and it, it just kept building and building over time to the point where. If you probably look at my caseload, it's it's well over a thousand cases firsthand, like you know, field investigator work, and it, so it's meeting the rubber on the road, you know, and climbing, climbing for the research, and uh, you know, uh, and that's what it was about. So I was on the front lines for those, and then eventually I, you know, led into me getting into MUFON when it was the Midwest UFO Network, and that was before you know. Uh, a lot. Blue Book was going on up the road, and occasionally I would bump into uh, a Blue Book officer uh, who was doing like the same case or something of that nature. And so we would compare notes, or I'd talk with them, and then we'd shared information. The next thing I know is they gave me a phone number to call RAPCON for radar approach control, and I could get up and get information about that. And I was connecting with Len Stringfield in Cincinnati, and him and I were talking a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would bump in occasionally to Heineck, who would be around at the Dayton Engineers Club giving presentations, and I would go and listen to him present. And then, uh, you know, I, I, again, I would bump into, like, you know, uh, Stanton, and I would bump into just all these big-name people and, uh, uh, you know, in the ufology world. And, and it was a very exciting time. And, Anyway, I just uh, I have, have a, a very long history with uh, bumping into this stuff, so it's it's been a joy for me. Yes, um, and I'm glad you're you you're at it because you you take it seriously. You do a nice a really nice job, and a lot has happened since uh, you and I were yeah. talking last. I mean, oh, a lot. Big time. There's a lot a lot to talk about. Um, 
and you're part of the um, Scientific Coalition. Um, how, what is the, uh, the full title of that? Well, we've just changed it. It was the Scientific Coalition for Ufology. And then we've now changed it to the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Ah, we wanted okay. to emphasize that we are studying this stuff. Yeah. And that was, that was important. And then the other thing that we learned from, we had a conference here in Huntsville, where yes. I live, uh, back in mid-March. And uh, at that conference, we had a lot of people that were saying, you know, we're trying to get scientists engaged from the, the military side. We have now, uh, you know, the UFO term has so much uh, that it's got a stigma even to professors and universities universities and various other things who want to do more where you mentioned the ufo and it, it's not it, it leads into you know all that's that wacky stuff right so uh much like you know europeans uh, have done it where they've switched over to uap we decided to go with uh, unidentified aerospace phenomena because aerospace is also covering the water as well as the air and space. So it's got all three of those mediums that we can use that one term for UFOs, USOs, and, and something else, you know? <laughs> and so that's pretty, we decided to go with that and scientists that we had and the professors we had and the doctors all agreed that that would be the better way to go. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I th think I should change my show to podcast UAP. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you know, you do such a great job with it that it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, I, I but but I, I'm just telling you that that there is a stigma out there that uh, has yeah. been keeping conversations uh, a little bit on the quiet side from a lot of people in in those scientific worlds, and and so we're trying to bring them and make them feel comfortable and it's easier for them to get this aerospace phenomena thing than it is UFO and come to a conference and maybe get approved by their universities. So there you go. Now, in the, the case, uh, in the conference you were just speaking about, um, where you had it in Huntsville there. Yeah. Um, I understand. Um, I, I, unfortunately I didn't go, but some friends went, uh, Randy Nickerson was there. Alejandro was there. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And so from what I understand, the, the most fascinating part that I got out of the bits and pieces of what I heard about that was that the, um, in particular, the Tic Tac UFO people are saying it's being beaten to death. Or, you know, we're talking about it too much. But um, in that in particular, I understand there was someone that did some study on the G-forces of uh, what they were actually visually seeing and seeing on radar and how impossible um, they would be for a craft that we know of to stay together and and certainly not any um, any beings inside um, being able to take those g-forces do you have any little tidbits on that in particular that you remember yeah so let me clarify that that Robert Powell got started back when the Paco she, Chiri or uh, Chirichi, I, I think that's how you say his name, uh, did a fighter sweep article on the, the whole Tic Tac uh, encounter. And so Robert got started with it at that time and began collecting evidence and getting a hold of things and trying to document this. And so uh, eventually, then over a period of time, we formed a, a team of us to begin to take a look at it and to put together a you know, and, and see what we could find out. And obviously we didn't have things like radar, actual radar data. And we didn't, all we had was the uh, testimony that was coming in. And so we began talking uh, and contacting uh, a lot of the, the witnesses to that. Uh, and, you know, these, and so what you could do, and, and this is where we're SEU is about, we're you know, typically a UFO report might get the tr very minimal treatment scientifically. Uh, it, it might get maybe like, a, you know, a couple pages or something like that. We saw that when with MUFON where we didn't see like lengthy analysis or long-term studies of it. And we thought that the better cases deserve that, right? They deserve our attention. 
And so we we said that we we're going to spend that time. And so we spent like, you know, over two years putting together this report. And part of the report was to document as much as we could about the case, about what the witnesses said, uh, our attempts at getting FOIA requests. We've got that whole, a whole section on that. We put together a glossary. We put together a, we put together a, an analysis based upon a lot of different factors. For example, uh, we had we talked with the radar people. They would describe objects that would be dropping down from the skies at like eighty thousand feet, and maybe stopping at twenty thousand, or even going to sea level and, and stopping just above the sea level in a matter of seconds. Okay. Uh, and then you would you would you would take a look at that and say, well, what what are the physics involved in that? What would what would uh, if you looked at that from a physical uh, physics standpoint, what could you deduce if you had something with a similar size to the Tic Tac? Uh, you know, let's say an airplane that's that's weighs a certain weight uh, or has a certain weight to it, and if it were if it were some uh, the acceleration, if you think about. If I move from 80,000 feet and I stop, or even 20,000 feet, it doesn't matter. If I'm at 20,000 feet and I go to sea level, and it's a matter of just a, uh, within less than a second, what, what is the G-force that would be experienced? What would be the speed of that? What, how would you accelerate to get to a certain point and then suddenly decelerate uh, to come to a full stop above the water? And the wonderful part about that whole thing is that, you know, you can use mathematics and, and, and basically uh, the, the, the types of things that we already understand and kind of deduce what that would be like. And so we said, let's do that. And so basically you had uh, Peter Reale who did that and took it on and, and put together uh, in his papers and in, in the back of it in the appendices section the physics of that are involved in that. And so you find out that like an object that would be going from like roughly 20,000 feet to sea level and stopping would, in 0.78 seconds or whatever like that would basically have uh, used, uh, moved at over 100,000 miles per hour or something of that nature. And we, and, and the other thing that we did, Martin, was to, we used uh, also conservative estimates instead of, Instead of it being like 0.78 seconds, let's use it at maybe like three seconds. Let's look at it at six seconds. And, and so we, we did that where we showed in a table kind of format what those different speeds would be to include what the different uh, the power inputs would, would have or outputs would have been to, to have done that. And then you start to look at that and then the G-forces and you come up with the fact that nobody could survive it. If it were like an aircraft falling from that sky or moving down at that sky, it would basically have disintegrated, and that the G forces exceeded anything human. And so we did that. And plus, we also took a look at it from the standpoint that, if you recall in the storyline, when when Fravor is making his upward motion and the object is too going from sea level and coming up to about twenty thousand feet as it was progressing up in its altitude. The object then leaves and then suddenly ends up very quickly over at the cap point. You hear them mention this combat air patrol, which is a classified point uh, of where they are supposed to uh, to actually meet uh, when they conduct this red-blue experience, uh, this red uh, war fighting kind of thing that they've got. Yeah. And so the fact that it did that, and we, you're able to now measure the speed because that's 60 miles away. And you're able to say, well, it, let's look at that one, you know. And so then you find out again, it exceeds beyond what we know of in the way of propulsion systems and the G force that would have been involved, uh, as well as the power that's required. At one point, one of our estimates showed that it would have been equivalent to potentially that of uh, Hoover Dam. Ah, uh, wow. Terms. And and then you you also take a look at the testimony of uh, Commander Slate. And you find out that, that he talks about there is like a kind of like a, a, a mirage like effect above the tic tac or around the tic tac. And he talks about that. 
And so you say, well, okay, is that some sort of a field around it, you know, and, and, and what would that be? And that's the kind of details you want from these very credible and very good observers who notice these very small details that help us to understand what might be with the phenomena, I mean, uh, and how it might be performing. And so we need more of that highly, you know, that, that kind of, and, and we'd love to be able to have the radar data, but, you know, obviously that's a little bit hard to get since it's apparently uh, not being found or released to us. Oh, um, well, um, I, I was just thinking that, uh, are there other cases that you've been able to study like this or, or is yeah. it, and can you talk about them where you've come up with, uh, some similar things? Well, uh, you know, I, I think you might, if you go up to the explorescu.org site uh, that we have, uh, we also did a 162-page paper a number of years ago on the Aguadilla case. And uh, I don't know if you recall that Aguadilla, Puerto Rico incident. But we, yes. we studied that. Uh, that you know. So those are really the two cases. Put together our reports, if you would, uh, and our study uh, of what we saw in the video clips, as well as the, uh, and both of them were like infrared or thermal imaging uh, kinds of uh, uh, cameras that were used. The Atflitter is, of course, a little bit different from the West Cam that was in the Aguadilla thing. And so you have to get head smart about uh, the whole thermal kind of like range and, and find out about the mid-wave IR uh, where it it is in terms of what it can reveal to you. Uh, and that's been a whole new world for us, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and now SU's got a total of about 22 PhDs on board and we're, we're continuing to now build partnerships with, with others as well. And uh, we're hoping that we can bring on more of the, uh, the thermal uh, experts out there. We try to take our studies over to them to get uh, as much as we can to have them peer reviewed. We had this document uh, peer reviewed and we had the last document looked at by the uh, the French uh, who also came back and, and pretty much confirmed, for example, that our, in the Aguadilla case, there was a question about the path and they confirmed uh, to us that the path was circular like we had thought that it was. Uh, and those things are helpful too. And I, we just need to have more peer reviewed or more uh, other kinds of like scientific companies or organizations take a look at this, our data, uh, the data and, uh, and do the same thing. Wow. Um, you go know, ahead. we are, we are ready to go to break. And uh, what I'm going to do okay. here is, uh, we're having some issues with Skype. So what we're going to do is I'm going to be actually calling you back on the phone. But for right now, uh, we are heading okay. into break. So hang in, everyone. We'll be right back right after these messages. All right. Welcome back. My guest tonight is Rich Hoffman. And we have him now on the phone. It should be a nice, clear signal. Um, right, Rich? You're there, aren't you? Well, I'm here. How are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that any better? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just make sure you hold the phone close, if you would. And um, so we were basically talking about, um, you know, the different, the uh, Puerto Rican um, incident, um, which there was a lot of, that's the first time I've actually seen, like, real science and uh, to work, um, people taking something really seriously. And it almost seems like a, um, this seemed to almost open the door for um, what we're seeing today a little bit. Just the fact that, um, you know, people are really looking at the subject more seriously. And, and what, what is your thoughts on that? I mean, you, you've seen a lot of change in, ever since, uh, you know, last year and a half or so, right? Oh, dramatically. And, you know, it, I, I kind of like, you know, it's one of those things where I look back on, on my history with this whole thing. Like, for example, you know, are the cases any different from what we had back in the 50s and 60s? And the answer is no, no. Uh, in the sense that we had military cases and we've had, you know, jet pursuits and we've had incursions in our airspace and we've had, you know, all, all that stuff has, has pretty much been there. And there's, so it's nothing for me. It's not, you know, my perspective anyway, it's nothing new. Uh, we've 
just had some incredible cases in the past that are not receiving as much attention uh, on the media side. Uh, I mean, yeah, they were they they got into National Enquirer or they got into something like that, but you didn't have anything that was uh, really grabbing hold of the attention like it is today. And and now you've got uh, you know the the whole thing is you've got more advanced technology that we have uh, over, I mean, our radar systems have dramatically improved our capabilities, uh, the, the aircraft and, and everything else are fabulous uh, and the top, uh, top notch. And so the fact that these kinds of systems are detecting these things and they're seeing that they're doing these incredible maneuvers and you have very high level credible pilots and you have the willingness to be able to confront it and put it on to like something like the New York times and, and then now, now it's out in these videos, and you have the credibility of the the fact that we found out that there was a program at the Pentagon, and, and you have the lead of that willing to talk about it and help us to get the to, to getting more. And so that's that's a holistically different flavor than what you had back in Blue Book days, and 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 where we were before. And so, to me, it's a whole like a whole other world, and I'm so happy to see that. You know, that they're saying that they, I mean, that basically saying that, yeah, these things do exist. And, oh, by the way, you know, uh, we need to pay attention to them. And, oh, by the way, yeah, there, there might be potential threats. And, you know, and they're, they're hanging over our, you know, nukes. Shouldn't we be concerned? <laughs> you know, shouldn't we, mm-hmm. should we not be concerned? And, and, should, and so I'm glad to see it's getting that serious attention. And it's helping a lot of more scientific People who were like I call them uh, going back to Jacques Vallée and Heineck's days, the Invisible College, are willing to actually now come out and talk a little bit, and there's more people that are willing to discuss it. So it to me, this is exciting times. I, I am yeah. thrilled to friggin' death. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm I, I'm totally with you there. I've I've seen you know for for um, just one thing alone, my listenership is greatly picked up with people just now looking into the topic that never had before. And so that's why I kind of dive into everyone's background, if, if they've been on the show before or not. Um, and, you know, what I've seen, um, you know, since um, this whole thing came out and, and, you know, I think it was December 16th or whatever it was, um, 2017, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, right. Since that time, you know, it just seems to be escalating to the, where more and more, um, you know, people are taking it seriously. I'll just tell you a quick situation. I was in, uh, uh, I'm a, uh, an appraiser. That's my profession. And I was down in Massachusetts. And as I was walking into this house, I saw all these Navy bumper stickers on the back of the car of the people that lived in this house where I was going. And I was in there. And after a while, I said, I had the courage to say, hey, did you hear about the Navy, you know, uh, re- the new reporting on UFOs, the Navy's uh, actually taking this seriously? And the woman wouldn't stop talking about it. <laughs> she she and her husband, her husband's retired, and, and um, they thought it was amazing and, and all that. And then she started telling me about a sighting. And um, I'm really always very, you know, careful about mentioning the UFO topic when it comes to my profession and all that. But uh, every once in a while, mm-hmm. it you know, I feel comfortable enough to talk about it. And, and this time it was received well, but you never know. But it's it's a lot more, um, it, it just seems a lot easier now than it was when I started the show, for sure. Yeah, and that's pretty much where I, I'm at. And to me, it's like at, when Blue Book was closed and, you know, they basically had the Condon report and everything else, it, it seemed like, you know, uh, the credibility of the whole subject went uh, down the toilet, and uh, and you just you know it's like you can't talk about them much anymore. And then over a period of time, you know it, it just got very very. I mean, more and more you just couldn't talk about it because it became a joke. I mean, you know, take a look at the tabloids and what they did with it, and oh, how yeah. they turned it into a joke, and and then you know you just couldn't even begin to discuss it and then over a period of time now you're able to come back and and talk about it and uh, and you have that if you would that top cover the fact that there's actually senators and and congressional people that are willing to listen and hear this and 
the fact that the Navy is and the Air Force are, are going to be switching to, I mean, uh, the Air Force has not been, I don't think, announced, but they, they've gone and made changes. And, and it's not like that they hadn't been, you know, concerned before. It's just that it didn't allow, uh, you know, the soldiers and stuff like that are just hesitant to bring it up, you know. <laughs> and so it now allows them to, to be a little bit more open and, and, oh, by the way, I saw something, and you know, and I that, 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 and they can talk about it and not be feeling like that they're going to be penalized, if you would. And so that that's going to, I think, open up a lot. I, I hope we can do the same thing for commercial pilots, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that that we now get more uh, openness if we could get that from the FAA and and, and the pilot people, uh, the you know, and, and and then we could also get it from other agencies. And and then the big question would be, well who would be the central body to be able to, to take a look at it and to collect all that because it is a global phenomenon and it's we need to be concerned about the threats that are over our you know over our land just as much as in the water <laughs> that's right so, uh, I'm, I'm hope i'm hoping that we and if we see this as a threat then that opens up doors for where are where are these things going what are they doing and uh, so anyway that's pretty much my thoughts i've i've uh I, I think i talked about this briefly last time you were on the show and and i still kind of feel the same way is that um mm-hmm. i don't think that um the air force whoever it is that is you know really looking at this topic uh, the pentagon um uh, dod whoever it is that's i don't think anyone knows any really that much more than any of us out here looking at it um, I still think it's a puzzle, and I think that's the reason, yeah. the main reason, the secrecy has been so long. Because how do you defend against something? You know, how do you take care of the skies when you don't know what the heck it is, and um, you can't assure the well, people I, that I, uh, this is happening, but we don't know what it is. You know, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't I, fly. I completely so agree speak. with you. But yeah, uh, we don't have any answers, and you know, and that's pretty clear. All we know is that there are these crafts that are outperforming uh, anything that we've got, and that they seem to be within our uh, airspace and you know and uh, and water space, you know, our, our waters as well. And and that why wouldn't we be concerned about that type of thing, especially knowing that other countries are doing the looking, and at the same time that you know that we're trying to say that it could be. Potentially, we don't since we don't know the origin. Uh, it could be uh, that somebody else has made greater advancements than we have, and why wouldn't we want to know that? And uh, and so that's, I think that that's that's finally coming around, and you know, we don't have the answers, and neither does the belief that the that the government has the answers per se in my book. Um, but it also doesn't preclude the fact that we aren't interested and haven't been interested from the standpoint of looking at it from an, uh, the propulsion systems and, 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 and how do we build these things. And if you think about us not paying attention to looking into anti-gravity or anything like that, certainly we've done that over this time. That's what the military would do. They would be looking at the, all the contracting firms and the companies and the Lockheeds and the Boeings at the, being able to look into that. I don't know if you saw that uh, – that the Navy came out uh, or that, that has a couple patents. Did, are you aware of that, that patent thing uh, no. that's going on with the United States? Okay, so there's a, if you go look up Salvatore Cesar Pais, who has uh, got a number of patents out right now that are looking at building something on the scale of a Tic Tac. And it gets into high-energy electromagnetic field generators. It gets into using uh, vacuum states around the object. Uh, it uses microwave transmitters. Uh, interesting enough, you know that you know that, and it's creating a, this kind of like a vacuum. And, and the whole paper is built around the fact that you reduce your inertial mass and your gravitational mass, and you can get to the point where you could do that very kind of thing, like the tic tac. You mean the moves? And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, you can do every all you can do basically <laughs> the same kinds of things that the tic tac is doing. And you know you're not going to suffer the inertial mass. You're going to be reducing your your the weight your weight. Uh, you're going to be able to interact. And so this these kind of like uh, patents that are out there are in the Navy. And and uh, I've been reading them. Uh, Hal Putoff was also 
also cited in, in that with this polarizable uh, vacuum approach to uh, general relativity. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is science uh, is progressing to the point where we're getting to the point where I think that we may be able to, to develop uh, these kind of technologies. But you have to realize that these objects have been doing this for a very, very, very long time. Right. And so I mean, we're going to start to see the potential for us to do that. But it's still in the, the theoretical world. I mean, we don't, I, I don't know that we're going to hear from uh, Lucky Martin that they've actually gone out and maybe done this or if they'll release it to us or if it's going to remain a, you know, a top secret uh, type of endeavor. But I think that we are actually experimenting in these kinds of things. And why wouldn't we be? I mean, uh, we've had plenty of time looking at this. Now, what about that that theory or that you were talking about? Does that address? Mm -hmm. um, um, there's never anyone uh, reporting, you know, the sound barrier being broken when this thing takes off. Does Correct. It, does that address it that? that? It does address that. It sure does. Wow. It does that address that. You know, and so, so I mean, you know, if I guess what I'm trying to get at is if you look at the, those five traits that Lou Elizondo talks about in his presentation. Uh, this type of an object could, uh, this, the Navy guy put together, is uh, is basically probably capable of doing that very thing uh, and all, all those types of things. It would be able to function in, in water as much as in air and as much as in space. So it's transmedium. It, it would be able to uh, basically maneuver seamlessly without the inertia issues. Uh, you know, so you could have a conceivably a pilot on the inside of it. I don't know how would they how that they would be shielded or whatever like that from the uh, the high energy electromagnetic field generators, but he even had in his diagram some sort of shielding to be able to protect somebody. So I mean that's we're starting to get there, I think, you know, uh, is what I'm trying to get at, is that we'll be able to... And then, uh, interesting enough, that these use microwave transmitters, and when I was doing the, the landing case that I investigated back in the 70s, where a 70-foot diameter area was completely baked two feet in the ground, you know, uh, and all the wheat was gone, there's puff wheat around the perimeter of the 70-foot diameter, there is microwave radiation. So, you know, are they using microwave you know, transmitters, uh, uh, is that what, what's involved here? And, and does that uh, bake the soil like we're expecting? So, so you get what I'm saying, right? It's, 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 it's a wonderful time. It's exciting. And I think that science is, is more, gonna more and more progress to the point where we're going to be able to look at and build some of these types of things. Wow. Um, the guest I had last week it was more or less convinced that um, what we're seeing is time travelers. And, um, you know, in a little tiny yeah. way that could fit in that's development of something, you know, yeah. way in the future, you know, that we're, we're actually seeing. But uh, I thought it was an interesting theory anyway. Um, but as far as, you know, the, the thing that always comes up when you talk to someone that is, uh, you know, rightly skeptic of how we are being visited, um, the, it always mm -hmm. comes up with a vast distance that it is to the nearest, you know, star system, the nearest solar system four and, and a half light they, years i wish that they were i wish that they would have been in my conference because we okay. had dr kevin canoe on and uh he, devin if you've ever heard him uh his presentation was on relativistic uh interstellar travel and you find out that typically if you look and, and this is the interesting thing i think that he did he looked at the speeds of ufo cases that we have that we have the uh, like for example the faa uh, case in Alaska. He looked at the, uh, and that had radar, right? So he looked at the speed there, and he looked at the speed of the Tic Tac, and he looked at uh, speed from the Bethune case. And, and, and he put all these cases together, and he said, these are the speeds that these objects seem to be going, okay? So let me project that out and say, can they go uh, at relativistic speeds uh, that we know of? And the answer was yes. And so then he progresses into the point of talking about, okay, so now if you've got that and you could build a craft that could do that, basically, how would you go out and to, to go into the interstellar and how long would it take you to do that? And then you get into the time 
anti-calculation kind of thing where, you know, as you go towards the speed of light, time slows down for the people on board, right? So it gets to the point where you could go to these, you know, uh, these light, light speeds, if you would, or near, near the light speed, and for them to go across the entire universe, it's only a matter of months. Hmm. All right. Gee. So, so it's a, it's in their time, and of course for us back here, it's going to be like you know thousands of years or whatever like that. So we keep hearing about the fact, oh, it's going to take you too long because we're keeping it from the standpoint of our own perspective. Mm-hmm. What you have to do is you look at it that if you get near the speed of light, it's slowing down for them. And for them, and he projected that and showed that these people could literally be on the other side of the galaxy in a matter of oh, days or something of that nature. And he's got that time all planned out. And then what if we were going to build uh, and to want to go and, and, and go to other extrasolar planets and we believe that life is? Well, guess what you would do? You would shoot off and you would become nomadic. You would go with a whole bunch of other people with you and basically go to that location because you know you're not going to be coming back. You're mm-hmm. going to go to that place and you're going to basically inhabit it, right? And then you go and shoot off again to other places from that, maybe that point of reference, knowing that you're not going to come back and stuff like that. So eventually you can get to the point where, it, because you're only traveling just a matter of months, you're basically there. You go and you settle down and you get screwed away and then you take off to other places. In a very short order, you could be already achieved going to multiple places that are inhabited or potential places where you could live. And, and, and so what's the problem here? You know, I mean, you get what I'm saying, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. And so that was his point, and that it was a dr- very dramatic presentation. It did a lot of reframe for a lot of us, because ultimately it's a situation where we, you know, we can do that. We could conceivably do that if we had even just the capabilities of a UFO that they've been demonstrating in those kind of speeds. Hmm. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. So um, just just wanted to, you mentioned earlier that you, um, you probably have uh, researched and, um, you know, basically worked on about 1,500 cases. Did I hear you say that? Something like that? Yeah, it's, yeah I've lost count over the, the, the years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're yeah. talking about 55, 55 years of my life. So, wow. Yeah. You know, I... Yeah, it's it's been a long time in, in a lot of cases. And there for a while, I was I was uh, the on with MUFON. I was the uh, on a star team side, and I was also the deputy director of investigations with them. And then I was also on the science review board committee that was actually looking at all of like the monthly cases that would come in, and we would pick the top ten cases each month. And so we were all reviewing hundreds of cases, even in the files there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's been a long time, but I, but that's pretty much what I did. I, I'm, I'm not like other researchers that spent your time in books. I'm the kind of researcher that was out in the field talking with witnesses. So I've got more of an understanding of that than I do, you know, the documented history and, and, and everything else. I leave that to people like Paul Dean and some of the others that the Isaac, uh, Cloys and, and everybody else that are out there doing that great work of researching documents and things. Now, you said um, you've worked um, for, uh, you've been a, a defense contractor. Has your, mm-hmm. y- has UFO, the UFO topic ever interfered in any type of way with that work? The UFO no, topic? You, you see my, my cube is decorated in UFO <laughs> paraphernalia. <laughs> and oh, that's I, great. I love it. In fact, in fact, the fun part about it today was I sent the list out, uh, about the show to a lot of the people that I work with and say, hey, I'm going to be on the, pro- the program tonight. You might want to check into it. So I'm oh, hoping great. that some of them are actually listening. Yeah. So, that's, yeah, that's... I mean, uh, they, they, they're they always telling me, hey, oh, I saw this on the news, Rich, or you're our UFO expert, you know, that type thing. So it's it's <laughs> it's pretty much exciting to see that, that, that that's happening now and it's getting more attention. Well, I know you're you're sort of in the IT. I think you said last time you were on the show that yeah, um, the, yeah. Is some of the work you do like cybersecurity as well. Any any yeah, type in fact, of work? That's, I, I, yeah, and so I I work on both uh, the, what they call the Nippernet and the Supernet sides, and uh, of, so I get to work in both worlds like that. And and, and in addition to that, it's it's a mixture of 
uh, cybersecurity. It's also uh, what they call portfolio management, meaning looking at I, I'm looking at investments and how we uh, can better uh, save money for the government uh, and how we do that. So I play into that world. I was working with a data center consolidation because we're trying to consolidate data centers uh, and, and to go into the cloud. Uh, mm-hmm. And we're also we're also getting into AI kind of technologies and, and looking at uh, big data platforms. So I, I'm into that kind of world. Wow. Well, one of the reasons I was asking, and, and because I was just kind of trying yeah. to see a little bit of a parallel, if there is one at all, I'm sure you know all about this. Um, the NSA lost some... Um, tools, uh, some cyber uh, sabotage tools. Uh, one was called Eternal Blue, and uh, it's mm-hmm. wreaking havoc. I know, for instance, right now in Baltimore, the city the city hall is basically down because of the cyber tool that the NSA actually created, and somehow it got hacked back in 2017, and the tool got out there. It was uh, actually offered uh, at auction and finally just given away for free. So now, like, North Korea is using it and, and possibly Russia. Uh, it's all over the world yep. right now. Um, I, I do have a point that I'm getting to eventually here. But um, okay. so yep. just for instance, the city of Baltimore was offered, you know, to pay a ransom of $100,000, and they refused to. And now it's cost them over $18 million to get their systems back and with lost fees and everything sure. else. So yep. um, when the NSA is asked about this, um, they say that they can't talk about it because it's classified. And they won't, you know, they're kind of like um, saying, well, we, if, uh, if uh, a Toyota, um, you know, smashed into a bunch of people and hurt them, would you go after Toyota? You know, they're, they're kind of blaming it that way. They created the tools. They're, they're not taking any responsibility for the leak of these tools and them, them tools out there. Um, do you think there's any parallel to the UFO topic in classified um, documents and the way things are classified so they just don't have to talk about the topic of UFOs? Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. I think that there, there's a, you know, there is a concern. I mean, the, certainly the IC world, the intelligence uh, side of the house and stuff like that is always like watching what's going on. And, and you know, that pretty much they're trying to protect that from their standpoint and i can understand trying to find out where things are at at the same time i know that from the military side we're we're doing our best to shield and defend uh and and protect as much of our information as possible i mean it it, and it and i'll say this much that you know the dod takes huge hits constantly because everybody's Mm -hmm. out trying to get into it right and so well, you know, you know, when you talk about like what they're doing with companies and stuff like that, well, the DOG gets maybe twenty or forty times that uh, traffic and attempt, and so you've got that, and so there's a tremendous effort going on to protect that. We're also very concerned about you know things like, for example, uh, you know, uh, control systems and, and the ability for me to go into a, a, a military location and control the dam and you know and open up the floodgates mm-hmm. or or if you got you know and, and how we're able to do that so there's a tremendous like focus right now on cybersecurity which there needs to be and to also consolidate systems to get into better uh like data centers and and looking at uh, uh how we're defended on our networks and and by the way who's on them uh, some of the concerns we've had are that you know if you take a look at even in building weapon systems and stuff like that. Well, sometimes, you know, we use we use the the universities to do some studies. Well, who's in the universities that has access to something like that? Oh, well, you find out a lot of the students that are there are foreign students who are coming in and very knowledgeable. <laughs> you know, and are they uh, providing information? And then you have the issue where we go into other countries and like China, and they want to be able to have you provide over the text, the diagrams, and various other things, or the things you want to be able to do in our country. So we're giving up the farm, is what I'm trying to say, a lot of times. And we talk too much, and we also share a lot. And so going back to the analogy with the UFO thing, 
if we're looking at this technology and we're coming up with ideas like this, I just got through telling you about this patent, mm -hmm. how much are we giving up the farm in that? And, and now uh, do we want to be more protective and more secure? And the answer I would say to you is we want to be more secure as a country because ultimately all the other countries are out trying to build hypersonic weapons and, 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 and weapons that, that can defeat everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, why wouldn't we want to be the best defended country around? So I, I think that we need to really get honest and say that we can't be as open as we like uh, and we need to, to do a better job of protecting what we do have. Yes, yes. Um, and But also, do you think that uh, as far as cl classified, I think last time you were on the show, we were, you were talking about you were getting some um, FOIA um, documents. And uh, is that also mm -hmm. something that uh, the, the SCU is actually um, heavily involved in on, in cases is getting, you know, the government documents. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you take a look at if Well, if you take a look at our report and it's not just us, so there's a whole bunch of people. I mean, my God, DIA must have been pummeled and they were pump, being pummeled by requests for FOIA, uh, you know, releases and stuff like that uh, as a result of just those videos and things like that. Oh, yeah. And everybody was trying to find out oh, where who, where is ATIP and who does it report to and, and you know, and everything else. And so, yeah, it's, FOIA requests basically uh, pummeled a lot of countries, including the UK. I mean, Nick Pope could probably tell you about what they had in the UK. I mean, part of the reason why that they went to doing the releases and stuff like that was because they were being pummeled with these requests for information. And so uh, we have a whole section in, in our reports that are dedicated to strictly just all the FOIA requests that we attempted and it didn't come out. Um, so we do try to get what we can, uh, and we understand when it's blacked out, there's probably a very good reason for it being blacked out. And, you know, and you take a look at the Mueller report, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you'll see the same kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, so the, and there's justifiable reasons for some of those things. You know, like uh, the videos often don't have, well, with the Nimitz case, they were cleansed to the point where they didn't have the GPS locations. Well, why is that important? Because we don't want to announce where we're doing our exercises. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's invite the Chinese or the Russians or somebody else, you know, over, so we know where we're going to be, and now they could be out doing all kinds of things to interact with that. So. I'm sure you probably heard that there's been controversy on of people saying that you know there's no real clear record on how those those videos were released and, and I don't know, uh, have you been following any of the back and forth on that? Yeah. And, and we finally got those, uh, the, uh, the, the document that was released. I think George Knapp released it that showed that the release happened. And I talked with Lou and, and, and Lou indicated that, you know, there are reasons why you don't, you list, you know, balloons and various other things mm -hmm. in the department of defense instead of putting the word UFO on it. Right. So, uh, you know, bottom line was it was cleared for release, and, and he provided a document. Now the big controversy is did did Lou work for a tip? And let's see if we can find a document that, that's out there that shows that Lou did that. Well, there's many documents out there that say that he's doing that. So there's an attempt right now to discredit Lou and yes. say that he's not he wasn't connected with a tip. Well, that's that's malarkey. Uh, you had contractors that had to report to him. There's people out there, I mean, uh, that had to interact with him. Uh, and I don't care what this DOD spokesman said. The, the DOD spokesman, by the, by the way, also previously said that there was no program on UFOs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that there is no ATIP. Or they were saying that same thing. And, and spokesman, I'm sorry, but, you know, go to a spokesman. You know, if I go to the DOD, and you only hear this, like, the DOD says this, or they say that, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that that's representative of everybody in the DOD? Hmm. No. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically somebody that in a, in a public affairs office maybe that might be responding, and that's based upon the information that they have. So, uh, you know, FOIA requests uh, are not handled consistently. Uh, they're... There's 
I can tell you this much, and I pointed this out, my computer's chock full of UFO information on it, and it's an Army computer, right? <laughs> and, you know, if Terry McKinnon wanted to come into it, he would have a field day and find and say now that the entire Army is in the UFOs. So <laughs> I see where you're going with that, yeah. Oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I, I, I laugh at some of the things that are being said, you know, that about the, the DOD or how it works. And it's apparent a lot of people just don't understand it. And why did they do what they do is mystif- mystery. But the, the, the people on the inside who have been there, they understand completely. And, uh, and they, they kind of like laugh at what they see that's out there in the, uh, in the unclass world. But yeah. anyway. Why do you think um, you just said you don't know why they do it? I I don't, I don't know why either, but, um, you know, why would you suppose, um, do you think there's, some, I always try to figure out motives and, and why someone would try to discredit this whole thing and, and, and say it's all hogwash and, and, um, I, I don't, I don't really get it. And you, well, I do. And let me, Lou even told you that he he basically said, Look, I ran into problems where people wanted to keep this thing quiet, and and people it was against their religious beliefs. It was against whatever mm-hmm. they. So he in, in, in experienced that pushback, mm-hmm. which I experienced well on a lot of different things that I do, where there's pushback, and and you know not everybody thinks the same way, and so you know bottom line is that there might be an element within the DoD that that says well we need to silence this but at the same time somebody else is saying that, that we need to open up more or we need to, to do that and so you have differences of opinions and you have differences of people knowing certain uh, uh, types of data and information i you know just the same as you do in talking to people in the regular world that you know you'll get different opinions you'll get different uh different statements from people i can go talk to two people over where i'm at right now and get two different uh two different statements and have them, you know, <laughs> they'll be contradictory. And so that's just the nature of these silos that are out there in the DOD world uh, mm-hmm. where information is not easily shared across it. And, and, and there's, then you run into the problem with classification sometimes where that, well, can't talk about it. And so, okay, then you're trying to figure out, well, what are you trying to say? Well, I can't tell you everything I want to say. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that, that's it. Go ahead. Well, no, um, I I think it's interesting, and and um, you know I, I didn't really look at it um, for, until you just mentioned. I, I didn't look at uh, why why people may have a reason to try to discredit. And no, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to open the line up if anyone wants to call in with a question. That phone number six zero three nine six seven four zero three zero, and if you have a question for our guest, please give us a ring. Um, so um, as far as the cases that you have worked on in the past, um, mm-hmm. what what would you consider the most fascinating case that you worked on? Most fascinating case? Yeah. Well, I've had, I've, I've had, you know, I, I enjoyed working on that uh, case in 2013, uh, uh, well, I mean, obviously things like Aguadilla and, and the Nimitz case are just really, really good. But in the past, I, I, in 2013, I also had a pilot case that was pretty fascinating where uh, uh, a small private pilot was flying uh, along uh, near uh, uh, well, southern Mississippi. And and basically he had a, a basically an object that came up about four foot in diameter that was you know, metallic, uh, kind of like a, a disc shape, if you would. There was no protrusions or ports or anything like that on it. And then that bottom line, it, it uh, came underneath the wing of his aircraft. And it was mm-hmm. following along as he was going at about, uh, you know, roughly about maybe 2,000 feet altitude. I'm trying to remember all the details, but he was you know, moving a, about maybe 254 miles an hour. And so he's flying along, it was a beautiful day, and, and he looks over underneath his wing, and here's this object that's right there that's, that's moving along with him. And, uh, and then so uh, just as qu- he was concerned about what, what it was doing, and he kept, like, looking at it, and then he would look back. And then the next thing you know is it, it started to, like, move behind him and fall back. Well, uh, 
we thought, you know, okay, well, that's a pretty interesting thing and tried to do everything we could to find out about it and whether it was being tracked at all. So let's get some radar data. We went to six radar sites and got the FAA data uh, and ha- wow. had that data looked at. And interesting enough, we found his plane flying along on one of the radars. And then on the, another radar that happened to be in Alabama, we were able to get the radar track of the object which then showed that it was moving and making some very interesting speed changes and direction changes, like 120 degree change, a drop back from the 254 miles, maybe an hour to something like about 35 miles an hour. Wow. And then, you know, and, and, and so, so we had that radar track for that. So, that, you know, it, to me, the, the most exciting cases are when you can get some multi-sensory kinds of like information, mm. or uh, or you have multiple witness cases that happen. Uh, uh, I've had you know other cases you know where people have seen some things like you know the triangles. Uh, I've had triangle cases that were over, for example, during military exercises, live fire. Uh, oh, wow. There was a live fire uh, exercise uh, army. Uh, incident that was going on down in, in southern Mississippi, and they were doing an exercise, and uh, you had one of the soldiers happen to, to look up, and, and another uh, soldier happened to see it too. But while they're doing the live fire exercise and all this other stuff, the, there was a triangle-shaped object that was just above them and, and watching the kind of things going on. And uh, then I had another case over in Mississippi where you have an individual that, like, who was an ex-sheriff Uh, This is in northern Mississippi, and and he's basically uh, out one night and happens to look up and see three objects moving across the sky, a a small orb-like object being followed by a uh, a helicopter, which was also followed by a triangular-shaped object. Wow. And they were moving across the sky, and and he happened to, apparently, he was... Somehow he was conversing with he 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 was out in his backyard. I'm trying to remember all the details on this. And there, there was like a field behind him, uh, and he goes back in the field and, and he hears voices. And apparently there was like military are wearing black camo kind of you know uniforms, military type uniforms that were back there. And a guy had around his neck, you know, you know those like cigarettes. Uh, uh, that the ladies wore in maybe New York city back in the forties where they had the strap around their neck and they had some sort of a flat thing and they were walking around selling cigarettes. Oh right? yeah. Mm-hmm. So he, uh, th- this was almost like a remote control device that he had around his neck and he's doing some sort of remote control thing. Well, they immediately told him to get out of the woods. Well, this is private. I mean like a uh, private property that's not theirs. And it's like, so anyway, he, uh, and they told him to, to shut up, and he didn't see anything, and so he leaves. <laughs> and then uh, we assign an investigator for, uh, from southern part of Mississippi to get a hold of him, and the next thing you know, he's having a conversation with them back and forth. And this was like a couple of days later that he had a knock on the door, and somebody came dressed up in like a, a suit or something like that and, and was holding up the emails that he was having with my field investigator and said, we, I thought we told you not to be talking about this. Oh my goodness. Wow. So he basically shut up and he wouldn't talk about it anymore. And so I've had cases like that. I've had cases where I've had, uh, the, the it was featured on the, the front page of the national Enquirer. Uh, Bob Pratt got a hold of it back in the, the 73 time period. I was out with uh, Patrolman Bob Bales, and, and there were like 30 residents are all watching this object that was doing some incredible stuff, and it eventually went over the patrol car that he was in, and he had a, a camera and took a picture of it, and it was spotted across the uh, uh, all of that. But 30 witnesses all seeing this thing, uh, and it was an odd-shaped object. Uh, that was pretty impressive. And then I had... Uh, encounters where I was giving a UFO presentation at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to the people down at Foreign Technology Division on UFOs. And, uh, and I would have, uh, I had an, one 
officer said, well, I, I'm a pilot and my job was to go out and film these things. And I'd come back and they would take my film. Uh, and I would be not supposed to be talking about it. And here he was telling me in private about it. Hmm. Uh, then I had, uh, landing cases where you'd have effects. And I mentioned, uh, the 70 foot in diameter area yep. in Carrollton, Ohio back in the mid seventies. So I've had a lot of very, very interesting cases. Uh, I had quite a number of them when I was like here in Alabama, I was a state director. And so I was investigating a lot of the cases here. And, and then of course the ones back in Dayton, uh, a lot of interesting cases as well. And some of those would involve, like I said, a, a blue book officer. I, I would be, uh, I had uh, in 73, I mean, that was just a, a wild and crazy time. I couldn't even keep up with the, the reports that were coming in, but uh, you had everything from landings to uh, you name it. I mean, it, <laughs> it was, it was a crazy time. Wow. wow. So those are just a few of the cases that I've dealt with and I've seen I've heard so many incredible stories I can't begin to tell you. That That's amazing. Those I, I love to hear about cases that I haven't heard about before, and mm -hmm. those are real, some real good ones. Yeah. Uh, recently, um, you mentioned this the, the pilot and, and the encounters there. Um, going back to what we talked briefly about at some point, the different videos that were re released, um, one of them mm -hmm. is has the nickname the Gimbal, and um, the Gimbal yeah. UFO, and... That was shot by, I believe, New Technology. Um, I believe that's uh, two, in 2014 or 15, around there off uh, off the East Coast. And um, uh, someone had wrote, now I haven't seen any article, but someone wrote me an email saying that Seth Shostak is from SETI, uh, the senior uh, scientist at SETI, um, had either written or maybe talked on his show. He does a show on science. It's actually really good. Um, that, uh, uh, that with new technology, um, you have anomalies. In other words, he's already explaining this away as, as something that is just an anomaly that has nothing to do with, you know, UFOs. Um, yeah, and, I love that kind of like, uh, <laughs> logic. Let me tell yeah. you, you're talking about, you're talking about state of the art equipment that basically is being placed on military aircraft mm -hmm. and, and by the way, it's not just on the aircraft, but you're talking about the Aegis system uh, that we have on ships, and you've got so many blasted sensors and different kinds of radars. I mean, if you take a look at the sheer volume of technology aboard, the, the Nimitz and that type thing, it's, it's really phenomenal. But going back to the aircraft, the aircraft have on them state-of-the-art. These things are tested to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. They have capabilities that can go down and... and the incredible level of detail. The thermal imaging can probably detect a hundredth of a degree variance in temperature. Uh, you, you, you can, you can, you can. Ca so, you know, yeah, right. I believe that uh, multiple aircraft using the state of the art kind of technology are experiencing kinds of problems like that, and they happen to show a video of that. You know, give me a break. <laughs> and it, you know, and it's. Just where you have, you know, you have people out there that just can't either accept it or that it's just, I mean, like I saw something where somebody said, you know, so you had a journalist that, that goes out to, for example, and they want to put something together. They go out and they find a scientist somewhere. Well, give me your thoughts. You're a scientist. You have a PhD. Tell me what you think about this thing. And so they, they come up, well, they were all hallucinations. Or, you know, that people can do this and you can, people can do that. Yeah, mass then, hallucinations. I've, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how long did you spend studying this? Well, I've never seen it. I've only, I just saw the video. Okay. So they don't talk about that. So now you've got the article being written where scientists say this. Yeah. And the rest of us are going and saying, oh, my God, you know, that's what it's got to be. It's got to be that. Well, excuse me, but, you know, when you're doing science, you follow the data, and the data should take you where you're going to make conclusions. And the data is what it's about. It's not even really even about too much in the way of testimony, because testimony from humans is also thought, fraught with all kinds of memory issues and fraught with problems uh, and interpretations. And 
So guess what? The 30 people that all saw the same object back that I was talking about, they all have different ways of describing it and saw different things and heard different things and that type of stuff. So you're mm-hmm. going to always experience variances with that. But I mean, but the bottom line there is that, you know, the data doesn't lie. So if you can get data, that that's great, and you should follow the data as much as you can. Now, when you don't have data, like if I, I'm waiting for the radar to come from that system, which I'd love to be able to have, and I'd love to be able to have all of the other kinds of stuff that, that, that was probably tracking it, like if there was sonar or, you know, I'd love to be able to have that because science can do something with that. But bottom line is, and we're trying to work through it, we'd love to be able to, you know, be uh, on the side to be able to have that access to look at that and use those PhDs the way I'm talking about them effectively. But nevertheless, yeah, technology, does it have problems and hiccups? It can. And everyone wants to go back to the good old rainbow days in the early days when it used to have uh, all kinds of interference and stuff like that. Well, the radar systems back in the 50s are not what they are in the year 2019. Mm-hmm. Okay? So we have dramatically improved those things, and they're calibrated. They're, they're looked at to the nth degree. And I, I, I'm sorry, it's just somebody looking to make an excuse or speculate which is what a lot of people like to do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I wasn't that surprised when I when I got that email. Yeah, you know. Um, Me either. Yeah. Um, now, you were going uh, talking earlier about this uh, this theory of of technology that could do things like the Tic Tac, and I think there are there are purportedly people or a person saying that you know those things actually went below the surface and were tracked at uh, an enormous speeds um, through sonar. Um, I don't know if you heard that part of it or, or not, and I don't know if that's been uh, vetted properly and, and all that, but 500 knots, uh, recorded at 500 knots. Have you heard any of that part of it? Yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, when we did uh, our report, we, did, we, we kept asking, did, did the Louisville happen to sight any or catch anything on its sonar? Just like we were asking if the E-2 Hawkeye had any radar. Mm-hmm. And the answers that we got at the time, talking with the witnesses that we could get to talk, we talked with, like, and I can't remember like how many people we talked with, but we talked with, with a lot of people. And, and we were looking for that. And the, the, the bottom line at the time was that we didn't really get any indication that sonar was captured. We kept asking, like you know, people like Kevin Day and others, did, did you have any awareness of that? And 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 you know, and the answer was no. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh, now we're hearing that maybe uh, some of the witnesses are saying that there, that there was sonar that was being uh, captured. Well, we look at it like this, you know, and and. That's great. It's another piece of testimony. We're talking about an incident for you know many many moons ago. We don't have any other independent witnesses to, to validate what that person is saying. So we just kind of diminish that and we say maybe that did, maybe it didn't happen. We don't have any really solid evidence. We just have witness testimony on it. Uh, and okay, it's just another one of those pieces of information you get around the case. And we didn't try to focus as much on the witness testimony as much as just documenting what they were saying. But at the same time, going into the analysis of, well, what would an object be like and trying to look at the, 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 the data from the video. Can we determine anything from the video evidence? Because that's, that, 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 that's where the key is. Mm-hmm. So is getting the data. And... Uh, so you get what I'm saying? We just yeah. kind of like, you know, okay, it's another piece of information, and we couldn't confirm it. We can't confirm it or deny it. I mean, okay, maybe it did, but we had talked to other people and said that, well, there wasn't any. And so now we're a little bit in a quandary with that. Right. Boy, it sure would be nice to see that the high-definition video that supposedly was, uh, was uh, captured and seen. Uh, it looks like we have a caller. I'm going to take that call now. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, caller, welcome to the show. What's your first name and where are you calling from? Hi, this is Robin from Brighton, Colorado. Hi, Robin. Welcome to the Hi. show. 
Hi. Hi. Oh, gosh. Am I on the air? Or is this a commercial? No, you are definitely I on the air. <laughs> oh, shoot. So uh, you have a question <laughs> for our guest? Well, a kind of a general sort of question. Like, I am the least non-techie tech person I've ever known. But I was out in my hot tub one night about 2.30 in the morning. How does the how would I, I have, I took a photo, okay, when I saw this huge blast of light in this boom, and I looked it up, and there was this, I don't even know how to describe it, there were like these three objects coming toward me, but then there was something larger, and by the time I got out of the tub and grabbed my really old, awful cell phone, and took a photo of it, all you could see is this, the most bizarre trail left in the sky. How, mm. I don't know how to, like, get the image off of the phone. I, I don't know how to do any of that techie tech stuff. Is <laughs> there anyone? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, there is. So uh, let me, like, let me... I'm sorry. I, I wish you. I had a more eloquent question for your guest, mm -hmm. but I just happened to my my iPad was on, and this came on, and I thought, oh my gosh, maybe somebody could tell me how can I get this image off of this phone. Yeah, and and I I, I can help you do that uh, if you want. Uh, I can give. Uh, I don't know how you want to do this, but I can give my contact information to uh, Martin. I, I've, yeah. I've had this happen over the years. When you're doing a UFO investigation, a lot of people are using and having more of the phone uh, kinds of things, and everybody's got a different kind of phone. And so, like, a, an iPhone does it a certain way, and another phone does it another way. And, and then there's a this problem we run into. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh no, I don't want to interrupt. I just I wish I had a more eloquent question for you other than oh my gosh, yeah. these guys know UFO stuff. <laughs> oh well. I don't know about that. I am so I apologize, but if I could get your information to have tell somebody tell me how to get this image okay. off of the phone. All right. Well, why because don't you I think uh, somebody I might be yeah. interested in seeing this. Well, we only have a couple minutes left to the show. So why don't you just email oh. me uh, just send me an email okay. at martin at podcast UFO, and we'll go from there. So uh, thanks for Martin. The, yep, at podcast UFO okay. dot, dot com. Yep. All right. Thank you, and I'm so sorry, and you all have a great night. All right, you too. All right. <laughs> bye. All right, bye. So um, we just have a couple minutes left, Rich. And, sure. Um, so I guess... Um, uh, I, I would like to say that I'm, I'm glad that you're you're doing what you're doing. I'm really happy that you are getting, you know, all these PhDs that are taking this thing seriously. And um, yeah. Uh, so the the last thing I can think of, are you working on anything um, that you haven't really talked about that the, as a coalition? Yeah. Well, we're we're kind of like looking at right now what do we do we hop on to the USS Roosevelt case? Uh, there's a couple other mm -hmm. cases that are out there, the USS, USS Bainbridge, and there's also the USS Boxer. The USS Boxer goes back to 1998, and it's also down in the San Diego area, the same general area where the image was. So uh, we're probably going to see if we can't, you know, uh, focus maybe on that. I, I'm, we're kind of like trying to decide right now what we're doing with that. We're doing a variety of other studies where we're doing the, uh, something like a care. It's, it's like a characteristic study of of shapes and various other things over over time and history. Uh, we're also doing a uh, USO kind of like a project where we're looking at, at, at documenting that, doing a statistical analysis on USOs. Um, oh, that's interesting. We're to me. also yeah. So we're we're doing uh, a lot of different things. I, I'm, I'm heavily engaged in setting up next year's conference right now. Uh, we're looking to try to get that squared away. It'll probably be a year from actually about today. Wow. Uh, hey, you know what? We're, we're out of time, Rich, I'm sorry to say. So okay. thanks so much. It's, it's been a real pleasure as always, and I hope to talk to you soon. All right. All right. Yeah, Take thank you for having me. All right. Take care. 
All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. That's it for our show. Um, And we'll be back next week with Robbie Graham. And uh, we are just plumb out of time, so i got to cut it now. Uh, Just remember to keep your eyes to the sky.